Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That sh- is not cool at all. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. It's the Odd, Odd, Odd to Newfoundland. Ghostly greetings from your host, Jonathan. Mysteries, ghosts, monsters, and lore. East Coast esoterica and so much more. If it's up to you, friend, it's on the up to you found line. <laughs> Ghostly greetings from the oldest city in North America. I'm your host, John Mallard, bringing you the best in East Coast esoterica. You, my friends, have stumbled upon the Odd the Newfoundland Paro podcast for the month of March 2017. Guys, hello, welcome to episode 38 of the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, your once a month paranormal variety show that comes out on the first of every month. And this, of course, is March. Beware the odds of March. Have a great St. Patrick's Day. Before we dig in, I gotta say, thank you so much to Donuts and Dragons Board Game Cafe, our sponsor for this show. I'd also like to say thank you to Paratruth Radio, Pazuzu's Haunted Toaster, and of course, The Mallard Report for having me on as a guest last month. Really, really helps get the message of my podcast out and talk a little tiny bit about why I'm into the paranormal stuff like that. So if you want to check out uh, what it's like to have the microphone turned around the other way, so to speak, please check out Pazuzu's Haunted Toaster, Paratruth Radio, and of course, The Mallard Report. What can I say? February was this really, really, really busy month. Yeah, I was the birthday boy on Valentine's Day. It was my 33rd birthday, so happy birthday to me. It was also very, very busy because it was my little boy Sam's very first birthday. Bless his heart. He had a great time and just a wonderful time with family and friends. It was just, uh, it was really special. You know, it really hit you. That first year just flies by because you're just so busy. And I'm sure everyone out there can relate who have kids anyway, how special that day is. But uh, alas, he is now but one years old. He's upstairs having a nap right now while I'm recording this. I've got the monitor downstairs, so you never know. You might hear him cry, but uh, happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to Sam. (laughs) Guys, it was a pretty awesome month. What can I say? Like I mentioned before, I got featured on those other podcasts, but also you may have noticed that I'm actually being featured right now by Podbean.com. When you actually go on your Podbean app and scroll down, one of the first things you'll see is the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, and uh, it was just such a, a humbling experience because... I jumped in there yesterday to uh, actually see where I was being featured too, because I was curious. You know, I'm, I'm actually got myself under religion and spirituality because I do believe spirituality is kind of like my behind the scenes theme of this whole podcast. The idea that there might be something more to this veil. And uh, <laughs> I look, and here I am. I'm featured right between Deepak Chopra's podcast and Joel Olstein's podcast. Now, <laughs> Deepak Chopra's a spiritual guru, and Joel Olstein's a very known evangelist. So. It was, it was really humbling to be featured between those two guys because I've actually read their books before, uh, in particular Deepak Chopra's and, and uh, Derek Mladeno's book, World of War Views. So just uh, just a really cool uh, cool feeling, and, and it should be really cool for all my listeners out there and people who have subscribed to this podcast because you know what? We certainly deserve that spotlight, and, and I just want to say thank you so much for anybody who may have seen my podcast being featured and actually became a subscriber this, this month and Really, I noticed a huge increase of subscribers ever since that went up. So welcome all to my show. Thank you so much for taking a chance on the little guy from Newfoundland. Trust me on this. I'm here to stay. Your once a month paranormal variety show will always deliver. In fact, I got fans all across the world. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And I'm actually going to read a little tiny bit of fan mail. I thought it'd be kind of cool before we dig in with the paranormal news. Uh, Because, you know, there's there's some things going on here that uh, I just... 
I want to share with you because it's a positive thing. It's positive for me. It's positive for you. And, you know, the paranormal doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. I'm here to bring the fun back, so to speak. I got this message on my On the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, actually. It says, Hi, I enjoy your show. Would like to visit your part of the world someday. From Will Lynch in Oklahoma. Well, Will, thanks so much for that lovely message. I'm telling you, I certainly appreciate it. And, uh, man, I would love to come to Oklahoma, too. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, got another message on uh, one of the episodes from uh, Sarah Avery. She says, I'm listening from St. John's. Happy face. I mean, if she had said listening from St. John's with no happy face, I'd be like, oh, my God, does she like the show? <laughs> or she hate it, but she said happy face. That, to me, is a thumbs up. So thank you, Sarah, for actually putting that out there. I really appreciate that. And then I got a sad message, uh, which is kind of strange. It came from a lady by the name of Jess Stamp, and I got this actually in my email at uh, lifeafterdeathsociety at gmail.com. And she wrote, I have researched orbs for many years and feel I wasted my time John, can you please cheer me up on the subject? I don't care what you do. Just do something to make me feel better. <laughs> well, to be honest with you, Jess, I, I can't make you feel better. Oh, who am I kidding? You know I have a whole month to plan something for you. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to cheer you up, so to speak. Let's see how well this does. Same camera shot Take a look at all of these orbs I caught This one's got a mustache What do you mean it's only from the camera flash Dust in the wind All these orbs are dust in the wind don't be fooled Overexposed bugs and hair follicles If you put them all online You'll be defending what they are most of the time Dust in the wind All my orbs are dust in the wind Yes, I'm doing the whole thing if you're wondering. <laughs> Are you cheered up yet, Jess? I'm cheered up. All right, last verse. You ready? Here it goes. Did you know 80% of dust is skin cells in your home? So orbs just might be dead people and you were kinda right. All dust in the wind. Are these orbs just dust in the wind? Dust in the wind. Tell me they're not just dust in the wind. <laughs> you know, if you guys would like a shout out, you'd like to have something sung to you, you want to have some fun, drop me a message, life at death society at gmail.com. Or you can direct, actually jump on the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, drop me a message, say, hey, John, I love your show, I hate your show, whatever. Maybe you can even comment on an episode or two. Reality is, just message me. I'm, I'm there. I'm very interactive. I do a once a month show, which means I do have some time to chat with you guys. How do I really feel about orbs? I'll be honest. I've seen some pretty compelling stuff.
And uh, I'm not saying they're all dust in the wind by singing that song, by the way. I'm just wanting to cheer up my good friend Jess. So, Mrs. Stamp, I hope you have a great day. Remember, people ridiculed me all the time, all the time for researching electronic voice phenomena. They make fun of me constantly. <laughs> Guess what? They didn't write a best-selling book on the subject. They are not a sought-after public speaker on the subject, and they sure as hell are not the host of the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Don't ever let anybody take your light, especially in a dimly lit area where water can reflect it. You know, little water molecules. A anyway. All right, now that I'm done butchering a classic by Kansas, and I'm, I'm actually hoping that the 40 people who did subscribe this month to the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast didn't just unsubscribe. By the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, Tell you what, you subscribe and I'll never sing again. That's my promise. <laughs> okay, guys. I want the paranormal news. You know, February was a weird month. What can I say? It was strange. It was odd. And probably the biggest news to come out of this month was actually that seven Earth sized worlds were discovered. Yeah, that's right. NASA announced the discovery of seven new planets, including three within the star's habitable zone. The remarkable find marks the first time that so many Earth-sized worlds have ever been found within a single solar system. The star, Trappist-1, is situated around 40 light-years away. Even more intriguing is the fact that the three of these planets are located within the star's habitable zone, the reason in which the temperature is just right, you know, that Goldilocks thing we're always looking for. The news is particularly exciting because of the next generation of telescopes it should be possible to determine exactly what type of atmosphere these worlds have. Now, another interesting aspect of these planets is that they are quite close together, meaning that if you could stood on the surface of one, you would see the others in the sky just as we see the moon, which is so cool, and all I can think about is Star Wars. Oh, man. The next step will be to use the Hubble Space Telescope to look for signs of methane and water, a potential indication of a habitable world. Beyond that, there is a chance that the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope will tell us whether or not something is living there. Man, that's going to be so cool. So there you have it. Scientists have been very, very busy in the month of February. I mean, I had to report that story because, well, some of the coolest stories ever told, you know, fake stories, should I say, you know, ones we made up are usually about stars in a galaxy far, far away. And uh, <laughs> it's just interesting to think that maybe, just maybe someday, we'll actually leave this planet and go see other places. You know, it, it begs the question, you know, were we seated here or were we put here by a higher power? Well, thank God the scientists have not, you know, ran out of steam discovering those planets because other scientists did something equally as important. I mean, for years, this has been a, tr a true problem for all of humanity. I'm so glad people actually dumped time and money into this because scientists have finally solved our catch-up problem. Yeah, I bet you don't even know what the heck I'm talking about. Well, think about it. You get down to the last little bit of ketchup in your bottle, and what do you end up doing? Swinging that sucker around, hoping you don't break lights around your house. You're smacking it on the butt like a misbehaved child. You're, you're trying your best to get that ketchup out of the bottle, but it just won't happen. Well, guess what? Thanks to researchers at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they believe that they have finally developed a solution to this age-old problem in the form of a new type of bottle coating. Now, this is really, really interesting. Going by the name of Liquiglide, this new liquid-solid coating makes it possible for every last drop of sauce to make its way out of the bottle without any of it getting stuck to the sides. Now, how cool is that? The cool thing about this is that because the coating is a composite of solid and liquid, it can be tailored to the product, said Professor Kerpa Veranazzi, one of the scientists who developed it. So for food, if we make the coating out of food-based materials... Well, technically you can eat it. So there you go. No more smacking the <laughs> smacking the ketchup bottle on the ass. I mean, science gave us seven new planets, and the solution to that science is awesome. And you know what? Scientists weren't done here. Well, weren't done there because you know we had to do something absolutely terrifying. Mankind has successfully brought back to life ten thousand year old life forms. Of course, they're microbes that were trapped inside cave crystals. But it's true as true can be, they're brought back to life. The organisms were found encased inside shafts of gypsum within Mexico's naked mountain caves, a place that has become synonymous with the study of life surviving in extreme environments. Incredibly, after extracting microbes from within the walls and crystals, scientists were actually able to revive them despite the fact that they had been trapped there between 10,000 and 50,000 years. 
So they actually are going with the, you know, less number here. They think it might be between 10 and 50,000 years. So that's amazing. Other people have made longer term claims about organisms that were still alive. But in this case, these organisms are very extraordinary. They are not very closely related to anything in the known genetic databases as of right now, said Dr. Penelope Boston. The Nyka Mountain Caves are among the most hostile environments on Earth. Anything attempting to survive there has to do with permanent darkness, stifling temperatures, and high levels of acidity. The fact that microbes recover from the caves can be revived even after tens of thousands of years demonstrates just how incredibly resilient life can be. <laughs> well, there you have it. Science just, just went crazy in the month of February. Loving it. Here's to the, here's to March being just as awesome. Now we all know what March brings. Yeah, the luck of the Irish lad. That's right. It brings St. Paddy's Day. Gotta love it. What have I told you? There's somebody out there investigating a gnome's case. So this kind of caught my eye. You know, I'm thinking of leprechauns, so let's let's give this a shot. A bizarre encounter by six school children in 1979 is a subject of a new investigation by Dr. Simon Young. The peculiar incident, which took place in Wallington Park, Nottingham, involved a group of young children aged between 8 and 10 who all claim to have witnessed a remarkable sight. Their testimony told of an evening encounter with several dozen white-bearded gnomes who, at half their height, wore naughty-style caps, and drove around the park in tiny bubble cars. Yes, the driver cars around the park. Let's chase the children. The children remained adamant that they had spent around 15 minutes in the gnome's company. Fast forward to the present day, and now writer and historian Dr. Simon Young has reopened the case in a renewed effort to get to the bottom of the mystery and learn what actually happened. To aid in his research, he is seeking out the original children, who will now be in their 40s, the Wallington Park sightings badly needs a longer study, he said. I would like to interview them about their memories. I will guarantee absolute anonymy, you know, just in case one of them managed to find the end of the rainbow. People are understandably very sensitive about these matters. <laughs> yeah, they're very short-tempered, too. Very, very short-tempered. Bizarrely, there were even encounters with the alleged gnomes by adult witnesses some years prior as detailed by Marjorie Johnson's book, Seeing Fairies. In the early 1900s, Mrs. C. George claimed to have seen little men dressed as policemen. <laughs> yeah, pull over. Pull over right now, child. You're under arrest. Here's a very short list of the things you've done wrong. <laughs> they were smiling, looking very happy, she said at the time. They hadn't any wings, and as far as I can remember, they were between two and three feet in height. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, they wouldn't even be able to put the handcuffs on you. They have to handcuff your big toes. Uh, oh, man. People are crazy. But luckily, people are equally as amazing. And sometimes we're amazing without even trying. Did you know there's actually a whole tribe of people, desert people, who evolved to drink poisonous water? This is so cool. I, I had to give this story to you guys because you know what? St. Patrick's Day doesn't just bring leprechauns. It brings the devil's water to you, the poison, shall we say. Lots and lots of alcohol to be enjoyed. We're actually talking about arsenic. The people of Chile's Atacama Desert had developed the ability to drink water laced with arsenic. The drinking water available to the people of South America's Cuadradra Camarones region is a particularly nasty concoction containing one microgram per liter of arsenic. That's 100 times more than the safe limit recommended for human consumption by the World Health Organization. You come to Newfoundland, you drink some Newfie Screech, you'd probably be immune to this stuff too. Despite this, however, the local people seem to be thriving. The reason for this, scientists believe, is because over thousands of years they have evolved the ability to consume it without ill effect. In a new study, Mario Apatow, the colleagues of the University of Chile in Santiago investigated the genes of 150 people who live in regions where the water contains deadly levels of the chemical. They found that these individuals had more of a protective enzyme capable of metabolizing arsenic into something that is less toxic and can be more easily expelled by the body. Our data suggests that a high arsenic metabolization capacity has been selected as an adaptive mechanism in these populations in order to survive in an arsenic-laden environment. That's just a really fancy way of saying we actually evolved through natural selection the ability to not so much as be immune, but to process the arsenic you know, that's in the bloodstream, basically, to the point where they have a bigger immunity than anybody else. It appears that in a relatively small amount of time, natural selection has resulted in an entire population population capable of surviving on a water source that would be deadly to most people. Now you think about the repercussions of that. 
to those people, you know, are the long-term effects. But that's beside the point. It, it just shows you that our bodies can adapt to these things. And as we slowly poison our Earth, maybe, just maybe, we could still learn to live here with a little bit higher levels of different things in drinking water. It is similar to lactose tolerance, something that emerged around 7,000 years ago due to a mutation which allowed adult, adults to digest milk through continual production of the enzyme lactase. Even to this day, only around 25 to 35 percent of the world population are able to drink milk. Let's hope arsenic, well, isn't you know readily available to everybody. We're not going to be missing. We're not going to be milking any animals for that. <laughs> okay, I got a question for you guys. You can answer me in the comments anywhere you see this posted to. Okay, wherever you see this podcast go up, why don't you tell me your problems? Who is your favorite DC hero? And the first person that pops in my mind is not Batman or Superman or even the Green Lantern or the Flash, even though I love those guys. My absolute favorite has got to be Aquaman because, you know, what? I, I love the underdog. And to be honest with you, he's looking pretty badass in his recent uh, adaptations. You know, he got his hand cut off and he's all evil looking. But anyway, I digress. We all know where he's from, right? A mythical city called Atlantis. Well, what if I told you James Cameron has found evidence of such a place? Yeah, that's right. The famed movie director has linked the discovery of Bronze Age anchors to the legend of Atlantis, the famously documented by the Greek philosopher Plato. Atlantis was said to be a continent situated in the middle of the Atlantic that was inhabited by a highly advanced and prosperous civilization. According to legend, the Atlanteans ultimately fell out of favor with the gods, and the entire island was submerged beneath the waves. Real-world theory suggests that if Atlantis did exist, it may have been sunk by a tsunami, a sustained period of volcanism, or some other ancient disaster. Now, when I say volcanism, I don't actually mean Spocks came down and took over. <laughs> I mean a lot of volcanoes. Whether or not Atlantis was a real place, however, has long remained a matter of heated debate. One prominent figure who has long been intrigued by the mystery is filmmaker James Cameron, who has been investigating the legend as part of a new TV documentary entitled Atlantis Rising. During the program, the investigation team made a particularly intriguing discovery in the form of six anchors dating back to 4,000 years. Found just outside the entrance of the Mediterranean, the anchors have been tentatively linked to the existence of Atlantis. These anchors could be between three and a half to 4,000 years old and establish a harbor in the Atlantic where I didn't even dare dream to find anchors, said filmmaker Simcha Jakovoci. It's because to f it's easier to find a needle in a haystack than Bronze Age anchors in the Atlantic. Whether the anchors really did have something to do with Atlantis, however, remains unclear. Of course, we can actually look online and find a clip um you know, from this documentary is called Investigating Rock Carvings, Atlantis Rising, and it's it's really, really interesting. James Cameron is no slouch when it comes to documentaries. I can't wait for this to come out, and uh, I think everyone should be pretty excited about that. Well, what can I say? It's been a real weird month. February was just weird. Let's hope March is just as strange, guys. Let's just hope it is, okay? You know, scientists found seven Earth-sized worlds around a nearby star. They also finally solved the problem of ketchup sticking to the inside of the bottle. And if that wasn't enough, they then revived 10,000-year-old life forms. <laughs> By the way, that kind of sounds like the premise of a zombie flick. Just letting you guys know. To quote Archer, do you want a zombie apocalypse? Because this is how you get a zombie apocalypse. Was a writer investigating the Walton Park gnomes. <laughs> get to get me leprechauns. There's desert people out there who can drink poisonous water ridden, absolutely laced with arsenic and still survive. Just amazing. And James Cameron, that's right, James Cameron, the director, has found evidence of Atlantis. Go, go team Aquaman. Just, just go. <laughs> All these stories have been odd to Newfoundland. We're almost ready to jump right on into oddities, 10 strange facts about your world that are very, very true. But first, we gotta check in with a very special St. Patrick's Day version. Of the MUFON Minute, I wonder how Laura's doing this St. Patrick's Day. I hope she doesn't get too messed up and, you know, just just looks up to the sky and sees just absolutely everything as a UFO. Because let me tell you, some people actually do that. Laura, Laura, brighten up our Patty's Day and tell us, tell us that these little men from Mars are not actually leprechauns. Thanks, John. Welcome to your MUFON Minute from March 2017. 
The big news of the last month was the unveiling of Winston Churchill's papers disclosing his views on the existence of aliens. It is important to note Churchill as a highly intelligent man who was actually the first British Prime Minister to appoint a scientific advisor, a wise decision given the important contribution of British technology to the war effort in areas like code breaking. In this newly unveiled paper, an awestruck Churchill wrote, I, for one, am not so immensely impressed by the success we are making of our civilization here that I am prepared to think we are the only spot in this immense universe that contains living, thinking creatures, or that we are the highest type of mental and physical development which has ever appeared in the vast compass of space and time. But this speculation depends upon the hypothesis that planets were formed in this way. Perhaps they were not. We know that there are millions of double stars, and if they could be formed, why not planetary systems? Churchill continues, I am not sufficiently conceited to think that my son is the only one with a family of planets. Mario Livio, an astrophysicist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, stated in Nature, At a time when a number of today's physicians shun science, I find it moving to recall a leader who engaged with it so profoundly. Also, I have been contacted by a local resident of the St. John's metro area concerning a potential sighting over the last month. If you have any information regarding this sighting, which included triangular shaped crafts and unidentified flying objects, please be sure to contact me directly at l.gilbert at mon.ca. To celebrate St. Patty's Day, I feel it only appropriate to tie in our move on minute to this holiday. There is a little story about leprechauns in Liverpool. In the summer of 1964, children saw little men in Jubilee Park of Liverpool. There has been a lot of debate on the little men that were witnessed that day, but the media quickly jumped to the term leprechauns. They wore white hats, and the little men were actually throwing sods at each other. Some of the witnesses do recall these events quite vividly saying, I was one of the school children that saw those leprechauns. I attended Bray Street School, and we saw them popping in and out of a window overlooking the schoolyard. There were about four of them, all tiny, dressed like a school book idea of a typical gnome, and they sat swinging their legs on the window ledge getting in and out. What they were, I don't know. I only know what they looked like. I'd love to know the truth. So, are leprechauns just another term for little green men from the stars? Are they folklore's explanation for a natural phenomena or entity? What do you think? On those crisp and clear nights, don't forget to get out there with your cameras and binoculars. And you could see something very special or very strange. If you do, don't forget to report it to www.mufon.com. For more information about MUFON and Newfoundland and Labrador, please be sure to check out Newfoundland UFO Network on Facebook. Luck of the Irish to you, John. Thank God. It's time for oddities. Alive. It's alive. It's alive. Boy, that escalated quickly. I want to believe. Welcome to the desert of the real. Party. All right, guys, it's time for oddities. Ten true facts that are very strange. Very, very strange. And you know, it's got to be true or else I won't post it. So here we go. Here it comes. Did you know that after racking up $40 in late fees for a VHS, Reed Hastings was inspired to start Netflix? Hmm? Seems like a reasonable thing. I used to rack up a lot of debt at Blockbuster Video when I was younger. Did you know that one in ten European babies are conceived in an Ikea bed? Hmm. Well, let me tell you. Europe. You owe Ikea, like... 
Oh my God! IKEA is like the greatest wingman of all time. When you think about it, that that's amazing. <laughs> Did you know a hippo can open its mouth wide enough to fit a four foot tall child inside? <laughs> I'll remember that next time my four foot tall four foot tall child gives me lip. I'll tell her she's going to the hippo. Did you know a man named Charles Osborne had the hiccups for sixty nine years? Sixty nine years. Oh God, I'd be so annoyed. What a horrible life, poor guy. Did you know a cockroach can live several weeks with its head cut off? You are a cockroach. Man, seven weeks with his head cut off? My God. You know, we keep talking about aliens and stuff like that. I mean, realistically, you haven't got to look very far. I think insects are so weird and alien-like. Several weeks with his head cut off? Really? Did you know 15% of the air you breathe in a metro station is human skin? Ha, ha, ha. Remember what I told you earlier about that, you know, high percentage of, of oxygen that you breathe in is actually full of skin cells? <laughs> yeah, you're breathing in dead people all the time. And this was actually a test that was done in, in, a, in a metro station, and they actually found that it was 15% of the air. Now, that's a really, actually really well-ventilated place, so people don't spend a whole lot of time there. They're in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. As opposed to your home where you're rubbing and scratching and doing it all. So there you go. It gives you an idea of just what's actually going on, though. Kind of gross when you think about it. You could be breathing in like your dead Aunt May or something. Did you know the tongue is the strongest muscle in the human body? It's also the most detrimental. You can really hurt people's feelings, guys. Always be nice. Try to be nice. Be nice. Don't be a jerk. Also, strongest muscle in your body. Got to love it. Did you know... That the Guinness Book of World Records holds the record for being the book most often stolen from public libraries. Now, that's, you know, great, great record, but not good for libraries. I mean, man, oh man, that poor, poor public libraries. That's not cool at all. It really isn't. Did you know a giraffe can clean its own ears with its 21 inch long tongue? I mean, how one of these creatures has not gotten into the porno industry yet? I have no idea. Oh, and this last oddity. The last one for the month of March 2017 is absolutely adorable. Did you know a group of pugs, you know, those cute little furry little sausagey little dogs. Oh, God, they're so cute. A group of pugs is called a, get this, a grumble. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Isn't that cute? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, speaking of sweet and cute, it's time to move on to our guest. Man, I just, look. Dina Ray is an awesome guest. You're going to really love her. So before I start and, and let that interview happen, and we got to go to a commercial, I'm just going to say this right away. Go grab your tinfoil hat. Go grab your NWO books. Go grab everything JFK was killed by five guys t-shirt. Go, go get it all because you know what? We're going to talk about the granddaddy of them all, the New World Order, as soon as we get back from these messages. Guys, don't you dare go away the following podcast is brought to you by newfie evp talking with the dead in newfoundland jump on amazon.ca today and get your free sample of the best-selling ebook in unexplained mysteries attention all podbean itunes stitcher and tune in radio listeners the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That is not cool at all. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. And welcome back to the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Guys, we've heard about the word conspiracy. It's been thrown around for so many years about so many different things. JFK, Area 51. And you know, this is the month of March. And I'm sure you've heard the old expression, beware the Ides of March, which actually has to do with one conspiracy to kill a certain Julius Caesar. But we're not here to talk about Caesar. We're going to let him, uh, leave him be, so to speak. And we're going to jump into the New World Order, the NWO, who's really running the place. And we're not talking the WCW faction that died a long time ago. We're talking the Rothschilds. We're talking the people behind the big people. We're talking to Dina Ray tonight, a conspiracy expert, the first ever to grace the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Dina, how are you tonight? 
I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you on too. And, and you know what? Th- this is the really, the really cool part. I-, I never ever had a chance to talk conspiracy with somebody. And definitely never had a chance to talk about NWO before, so this is going to be just something fresh for my listeners who probably haven't heard it from this particular source before. Uh, well, bring it on! I'm excited to be here. Okay, all mm-hmm. right, Dina, let's let's just dive right on in. You said it yourself, NWO, New World Order. Who's really pulling the strings? Let's just dive right on in and tell me how you got interested in this topic. NWO, of course, uh, the word own is spelled backwards and that has a lot to do with the whole entire conspiracy theory people who believe in new world order do not believe that we have democratic societies they believe that a handful of people are really running things and they're moving us around like pieces on a chessboard just uh waiting to uh declare a one world government and uh then rule over us and if we're useful, we'll stay and serve them in some slavery type of way. And if we're not useful, then we've got to go. Uh, and that- it makes me think of George Carlin. <laughs> I'm sure you heard this guy before. One of my favorite oh, comedians. Yeah. Raunchy as it gets, though. Now, we don't curse on the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, so I'll just give you a little Mad Lib from one of his things. He talks about people being smart enough to run the machines, but not smart, not too smart to realize that they're getting screwed over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's that. I, I met him once uh, in, in a bar in uh, L.A. I got to meet him uh, many years ago. What? You met? Yeah. George. Now, what's the chances of yeah. that? I, I had no idea, and I just brought him up. That's so funny. <laughs> I, I, we're not friends or anything. He bought me and my girlfriend a drink after we recognized him. He signed our cocktail napkin and had a pleasant five-minute conversation with us, and then we left him alone. We figured he just wanted to talk to the bartender who seemed he seemed friendly with. <laughs> Interesting. So I'm sorry. I'm kind of getting off topic already. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of got off, too. This is all my fault, but you know what? This is the fun of having a podcast and meeting someone for the first time because, well, lo and behold, I met somebody who met George Carlin, like one of my favorite <laughs> favorite comedians. Weird, weird first three minutes. Definitely the weirdest we've had so far. Okay, let's get right back into it. NWO. So who are pulling the strings, and what exactly are those strings? Well, there's a handful of people in this world who want globalization. And um, we, we talk a little bit about it in America I don't know if you talk about it in Newfoundland or Canada, but it's definitely a topic uh, that's not quite mainstream, but it is gaining ground. Uh, Even some famous news reporters are starting to use the term globalization and new world order. And we're all starting to come to the realization, which I, I... Um, realized many, many years ago, but more and more people are starting to jump on board that, again, we are not running things. The higher-ups in this world want a one-world government. They do not want um, nation-states like we have right now. They just want um, like a global set of rules. And we're seeing it more and more with the UN, with the World Trade Organization, with um, a Codex Alimentarius in the um, EU, we're just seeing more and more of it. And um, I think like this whole uh, odd obsession that uh, uh, Europe and the United States has with um, having refugees come in here for most Americans don't know why um, is part of it. It's this need to mix the bag, shake it up, get um, as many people mixed together as they can, and then bam, it's going to hit us. We won't be a country anymore, and nobody else will either. We will be a one-world government. Interesting stuff. So the first thing that pops in my head when I think of a one-world government is probably like a one-world currency. Because realistically, what divides us mostly really all over the world, is the amount of money each country and, and small cities and whatnot have. The poorest of the poor rely on the on the riches of the rich. It's very interesting. What do you think about that? Do you, do you think that we'll all be on like a one-world currency? Oh, absolutely. And it's already starting now. We've got the Bitcoin. 
and that's going great guns. So we've already got some uh, precursors to uh, a, a currency. And, of course, m- different wealthy countries are jockeying to to have that currency because they think that they will get the upper hand in this one world government. But the reality is uh, only a handful of people will have the upper hand. So the currency doesn't quite matter. Um, I don't know how Canada works, but America used to be on the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Well, the last time we took inventory on the gold wasn't even much of an inventory. And that was during Nixon in, uh, I think, 1970, 1971. And he didn't even see much of it. Um, why? I don't understand it, how we can supposedly have all this gold and then nobody takes inventory of it for going on 50 years now. I think um, it's, I think okay. it's really I think it's really interesting that we have a paper currency, which is actually supposed to be denoting gold. People don't realize yeah. that's what a, yeah. a five dollar bill is. It's basically a piece of paper saying I own this much gold. Or a piece of gold. And thus we have inflation when we just print more paper money. You know, it's interesting that there's so many different things going on that would lead to you, lead you to believe that there really is, well, someone who owns us all. Who do you think is really, (laughs) let's name some name and names. If if there really is an NWO, who do you think are key players? I'm thinking, like, the first thing that pops in my head right now, of course, he just got elected, would be Donald Trump. I mean, what does he play into this, do you believe, Dina? Do Do you think he has anything to do with this at all? No, I don't. Actually, he's one of the few uh, people that I don't think has anything to do with it, which is why he gets such terrible, horrible press. Uh, He was not supposed to win this election. Hillary Clinton was supposed to win this election. Uh, The media here in the United States of America, about 90 percent of the main uh, stations touted Hillary and um would make Donald Trump basically look like an idiot. And, hey, he did a great job making himself look like an idiot. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> the 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 uh, cards were definitely stacked in Hillary Clinton's favor. I, 90, she had 90% of the media in her pocket, and uh, she had a lot of scandals going on. So um, the fact that he, he won um, is a miracle. And now that he's president... Hey, I don't know if he's going to be the best president or the worst president. Nobody knows that now. But if you turn on the news, about 90% of the media um, has this guy pegged for Hitler, for the next Hitler. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, his his daughter converted to being a Jew. His grandchildren are, Jew, are Jewish. <laughs> his son-in-law is a Jew. So where this Hitler stuff is coming, I'm not really too sure. But um, he's, you know, he's got a a reputation among 90 percent of the media in this country, which to me, as a New World Order conspiracy theorist, tells me that this guy was not supposed to be in the position that he's in. And um, I, I hope to God this doesn't happen. But if you remember what happened to Kennedy, he thought he was actually running things. And look what happened to him. Gotcha. So. That's really interesting. It's funny. As soon as you said that, it's the first person that popped in my head. And, of course, uh, you did cut out there for a second. Uh, she said Kennedy that time. Um, I will say this. You know, we never, ever did find out what was happening on that grassy knoll. Right. <laughs> what do you know about the Kennedy assassination? I mean, i, I got to jump a little tiny into that because this would tie into the NWO, the New World Order, too. Well, that, that's uh, interesting that you mentioned that. I live outside of Dallas. I live about 20 minutes outside of Dallas. So every time I've got family or friends that come and visit me, they all want to go see the Kennedy Museum. So we all go to the Sixth Floor Museum right in Dallas. And um, that's a great place if you're ever in the area. That's a definite must-see. They do um, a great job. Uh, They preserve it as a library. And um, they've got a whole wall dedicated to conspiracy theories on JFK's murder. So... um, you know, here's a here's a museum about the murder of uh, JFK, and then even the museum curator is putting it out that maybe Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't really responsible. Um, he, of course, got murdered by Jack Ruby before anyone could hear his story, which uh, makes it look even shadier. 
um, you know, he was sleeping with the mob, uh, mobster's girlfriend. He had ties with the mob. He um, was doing whatever he felt like. He, he thought he was the president. But in the end, it sure looks like the gov- government had him killed. Really interesting stuff. So tell me something. The NWO, back on topic a little time bit more here. Was Is there like a founding, shall we say, member? Or, or is this like a group of people? Or is this like a bunch of people in power? Like, like, let's name some names of who you believe right now are a part of the NWO. Well, most definitely the royal family of England are heavy hitters in all of this and i know they keep a low profile they're pretty quiet uh people cl- say well they're just figureheads they don't really have any power well nobody even knows how much money they're worth which is kind of weird everyone knows they're worth millions if not billions of dollars but th- no one audits them uh they own all kinds of property in uh, around the Colorado airport, which is another target for conspiracy uh, ther- theorists. Uh, they own property everywhere, actually. They have um, supposedly underground bunkers. They've got all kinds of things going on in case we're um, in a nuclear situation. They will they will be spared. Interesting. So what do you think is the main goal of the New World Order? You know, I'd like to think that if there's just truly this large group of people who are trying to control different parts of government, like, got their hands, like, this has got to be the biggest. It's funny, you said the granddaddy of them all, this conspiracy would be, because this would be the conspiracy to end all conspiracies. This is the conspiracy behind the conspiracy that a lot of people believe. But who, what, and how? This must have been an origin point. When did this all begin? Well, I believe this all began in biblical times with with um, the Freemasons. They um, they're they're called the Freemasons because of Hiram Abeth from um, the Bible. He built Solomon's temple and he built all kinds of secret tunnels and um, they say owed to him every time they have their meetings. And um, of course, you mentioned the Illuminati. Well, the Illuminati is really just the Freemasons, and um, when they got ousted. From Germany, they went over to Scotland and they joined a lodge and they became the Freemasons. So, I mean, they're all in, it's an incestual relationship with these secret societies. And um, one of um, the Freemasons that I love to point to most in modern day was Albert Pike, who was around in the 1800s. And um, some say he was even um, part of the one of the founders of the Ku Klux Klan. But there's no, in all fairness, there's no proof on that. But he was definitely um, a a Confederate sympathizer. Well, um, anyway, he wrote a letter many years ago, well, 150 years ago or so, to um, a big shot in Italy called Giuseppe Mazzini. And in that letter, it described how to obtain new world order. Uh, I don't think he used the term new world order. I think he said something like a one world government, but he outlined there's going to have to be three great wars and they're going to have to be between America's going to have to be involved and Europe's going to be involved. And if anybody else is great, but we have to have those two countries involved. And of course we have world war one and then we have world war two and it seems now we're, we're waiting on World War III. And a little bit about this letter, it used to hang in the British Museum. And they took it down maybe 10 years ago. Hmm. Now, why would they do that? I don't know. <laughs> maybe New World Order started gaining popularity. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. You tell me. I, I have no idea. It's very strange. It, it almost seems like there's something going on behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Huh. Absolutely. It, uh, and just a, um, a, just a, a little bit, one more tidbit about this Albert Pike. He um, wrote that Morals and Dogma, the, um, the, the modern day handbook of the Freemasonry. Um, what most people don't know is he has this enormous statue of him in Washington, D.C. Like he's almost as if he's as great as George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. He's got that kind of stature. Hmm. Interesting stuff. 
So moving right along here, let's say that I was to, I don't know, want to get in on this NWO. I want to become a part of this. I want to join the NWO. How do I do that? There must be a way to get there. What what would what would have to be on my resume to be a card carrying member of this well, conspiracy to end all conspiracies? Well, you already mentioned the Rothschilds. I mean, they've come from a long line of bankers and they've all inherited money and become wealthier and wealthier with each passing generation. So some people are born into it, and then other people are chosen. Um, many people think that Bill Clinton is is part of this whole secret society. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and Cecil Rhodes, who um, started this whole scholarship over at Cambridge, he was a, a, a very famous Freemason. So some people are picked, some people are born into it. Uh, it depends, and... They like, of course, they like politicians, they like college professors, they like the media, they like pop, uh, many people in, in pop culture. Uh, don't get me started on all of the um, Hollywood celebrities that are <laughs> plugging this. Oh, guess what? <laughs> I'm so going to get you started on that because <laughs> all I could think in the back of my head as I'm watching that Super Bowl performance is, oh my God, she's going to do it. She's going to do it. Here it comes. She's going to cover up. And she didn't do it. Oh, uh, Lady Gaga. Well, well, wait a minute. I got, I, I, she didn't open her mouth and, and verbally attack the, you know, the Hitler regime of Donald Trump or anything like that. But um, her um, performance, supposedly, now, now, I didn't think of this when I saw it. I'm really getting this from some very religious zealot type of friends on my Facebook account. Um, that whole entire routine was symbolic uh, gesture to Satanism. Like, well, just bear with me. When she fell from the top of that stadium, that was supposed to represent the fall of Lucifer. Mm. Okay? Um, you know, you could... Take what you will about all this, and then some of the lyrics in her songs had um, had de denoted uh, New World Order and Satanism. I wish I don't ha I don't know exactly which ones. It was hard to understand uh, the words when she was singing, but a lot of people seem to think that whole routine was more than a performance. I, especially the part where she said, "I love you, mom." That that was definitely something fishy there. <laughs> 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 oh, Dina. I'm glad we can still laugh about this stuff because sometimes I just, ugh, I, I don't want to be the hamster on the wheel that runs the society for these big wigs to make more money. And, and I'm kind of glad we can still have a chuckle about that. But there comes a time when we must face facts. There have been, well, many more conspiracies that are joined to the NWO. And I'm sure there's lots of stuff that me and you can talk about in depth here. Um, the NWO itself, though, I mean, it's kind of it kind of links into seems more like a, a money thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. It seems like that. It seems like whoever has a lot of money seems to be in on this. But what other stars, shall we say? Because when I say star, I don't just mean like singers like Lady Gaga. Apparently, there's many famous type people, actors, you name them. Mm -hmm. They're all into it. So, but that are there anybody other people out there who are of note that you can kind of shed a little light on here? Well, of course, everybody likes to um, point to. Uh, Bill Gates. He's always involved and in, if you think about it, he's got a pretty big piece of the pie in the computer market. So um, he definitely is, he could probably figure out how to put something in um, all of his Microsoft software to know what all of us are doing. Kind of like that um, that famous book, 1984, when when the government knows, uh, got cameras in your house and they know everything that you're doing. Well, he could probably do the same thing. He could probably rig it where in his software he'd know what everybody's doing. Um, he's, of course, one of the big ones. Uh, of course, we've got Google. We've got um, Amazon. Uh, what's that? Be Bezos, I believe it is. Uh, we've got a lot of heavy hitters in industry, and then uh, we got Rupert Murdoch in um, the press. So 
you kind of got you you need a little bit more than rich people you need your academics because a lot of people seem to think that colleges are brainwashing kids into um a lot of leftist type of ideas um you know it it takes a village so to speak to get this thing off the ground and I know the UN has made a couple uh, resolutions, excuse me, that want to take away guns, that want to take away property. And all of this stuff is very important to Americans. We, it, you want to threaten to take away our guns? I don't even own a gun, but I don't like the sound of that. Uh, that sounds like you want to control me. And then, of course, the no property um, we've got going on here in America, we've got a ton of ton of foreclosures uh we've got there they we've got all these commercials for reverse mortgages i mean how awful is that they're trying to convince old people to get a reverse mortgage so that when they die they leave their kids nothing there's no wealth passed on anymore to middle class people so there's definitely a lot to be worried about there's a lot of signs that do not want to help people get money and get good jobs a lot of things that want people to give up what they have there was a did you ever hear of the goddard tunnel in switzerland never heard of it oh this is gonna be great go ahead tell me all about it (laughs) oh my gosh if you want some freaky stuff on your website you need to Shit, put this, uh, embed this, uh, video of their opening act that they did. Um, just a, a brief background story. In, uh, Switzerland, they made this big fancy tunnel for their railway cars and it took them um, like decades to do this thing. It went through a bunch of mountains and, um, it was an engineering feat that they were really proud of. So it finally opened up in the summer of 2016 so what six seven months ago yep okay well in honor of the opening of this tunnel a lot of heads of states were there like angela merkel was one of them the um president of switzerland i can't think of his name um oland from france um it the place was brimming with big shots and celebrities so they had this they hired this whole dance troupe acting troupe like a show troupe to put on this big to do ceremony in honor of opening this tunnel oh and let me guess it was something like crazy satanic oh okay i'm not even i'll get i'll I'll give you credit okay lady gaga's (laughs) performance was a stretch okay this is not a stretch (laughs) this is not a stretch at all this is oh my gosh you you i mean you cannot talk your way out of this one. This is a demonic ceremony all the way through and through. There's no arguing that it's not. It's so in your face. <laughs> and, I, you know, this is what they're – this is the government commissioned this. So it just goes to okay. show you there's, there's not just a Christian agenda at hand here or a Jewish one or a Buddhist one. There's actually Satanist ones as well. Well, so, Switzerland, I mean, they're obviously known for their banking. That's where all the money is. And, and here they're, like, paying old to Lucifer when they open up their tunnel. I mean, please watch this video. Laugh, laugh all you want. But wait till you see some of this craziness. Okay? I, I've got to see hey. this video now. I've got to see this video. This this has to happen. What's the name of the video? It's a... Uh, well, it's... um. Full bizarre demonic gutter tunnel opening ceremony. Okay, uh, on one of the train cars, there's a bunch of um, men and women who are like in like nude flesh color body suits, and then they're all like acting like they're getting it on, like it's a mass orgy. Um, my kind, another... my kind of train. I like this train. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I mean, you know what? The hell with the watches. I'm going for the orgies on the train. <laughs> You have got there's there's another woman there's a woman in this black angel outfit and she's like floating over the ceiling of the tunnel and then she falls onto the train like another fallen angel reference. There's um this one guy you know that uh 
goat that I can't think of the name that goat that they always associate with uh, Satan. Off the top I, of my head, I can't think. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, well, well. anyway, they've got a man dressed up just like this satanic uh, goat. And he's um, walking around with a club hitting uh, other dancers. Oh, my God. Okay. It's ba- Baphomet. That's, that's what he's, the goat yeah, is called. Baphomet. Baphomet. Okay, there you go. Uh, I just, you have got to see this thing because it is, talk about freaky it is total nut, total wacko. I, how any government would condone this? It really says a lot about themselves because this is it's just not normal. Okay, I, I got the, I got to look this up and find out the name of the video here because it kind of broke up when you said it earlier. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> so I'm looking for Switzerland. Hang on now, Switzerland. Got, uh, the Gotterd, Gotterd, uh, G-O-T-T, uh, okay, here it is. A-R-D. I, I found it. It's co- <laughs> and right away, the first caption is bizarre opening ceremony for Gotterd. <laughs> okay, hang on. Okay. This is, this is totally getting linked. This is totally getting linked to my webpage. This has got to happen. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, sorry. I, sorry. I, I, bizarre I opening just, ceremony for <laughs> Gotterd Base Tunnel in Switzerland. Okay, so this this is yes. so we got to put the I just want to put it out there so people who are listening to this show and and hearing about me and you talk about this right now are gonna be like oh my god I got because they're, they're all gonna be interested in seeing it what it is you know what I mean so it should be really <laughs> interesting to get it out there there you go folks even more weirdness going on why the heck would a with government well then again though when you think about it I mean those churches are getting funded too so this is this, there's a lot there's a lot going on. Oh my God, my head is a spin. It's absolutely melted. Well, thank God we're at the end of this half hour, Dean. I don't think I can handle much more of this conspiracy stuff. I'm just going to be a nervous wreck tonight. I'm going to take an Ativan to sleep because I'm scared to go. I'm just scared to death. But you know what? I'm not scared to death. Is to tell everybody who's listening to my show right now that check out Dina. Uh, my uh, book is called The Bestseller, and it's on sale this month for $1.99. Um, you can buy it on Amazon or most um, large book distributors, and you could also buy it through my publisher, Solstice Publishing. It is a uh, conspiracy theory theme about aliens and scientists in World War II that Hitler was employing to uh, learn more about aliens. And um, it brings in a lot of the occult that Hitler was practicing in the story and um the second book will be out this summer <laughs> okay so to correct myself from what i said earlier <laughs> it's dina ray's right stuff dot blogspot dot com dina <laughs> dina <laughs> ray's rights w-r-i-t-e-s stuff i'll make sure the link is in our show notes anyway when this goes all over the world dina thank you so much for just ruining my perception of reality tonight i really appreciate <laughs> it and uh, everyone's gonna go home and uh, we're all like, you know, going to watch that performance by Lady Gaga and uh, start worshiping <laughs> Lucifer. You have yourself a great night. You too. Thank you so much. Well, the time to say goodbye is upon us. But don't worry, you can keep track of the Odd Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast very easily. It's available on Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, and TuneIn Radio. Just look for the Odd Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast banner. Of course, if you'd like to keep up to date, you can always check out the Odd New Land Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, drop a like, and every single time a new show goes up, you'll be notified. You can also follow me, John Mallard, on Twitter at O-D-D-T-O-N-F-L-D. That's Odd to Newfoundland. Get your latest news on the podcast as well as the ever-popular para-joke of the day. From the oldest city in North America, I bid you adieu. From the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast.